know, they want to see the bee reel that you know, goes on the board. <laughs> You don't ever have to see a horse like that? They're literally the best. They're so fast. I literally hate horse like that. They're the worst thing I've ever done. Okay, wasps serve no purpose for the environment. <laughs> okay. Like, bees can sting me, but I won't mind because bees are good for the environment and also blow dry bees. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you but like, yeah, but like, they don't do anything. They literally serve nothing. Exactly. They're, they're really awful. Like, if I see a lot of them, I'm like, I'm going to take the dumbest thing. Uh, yeah, I, I've come to be really unfortunate in talking to people. Yeah, it's I know that. Um, and they're very talkative. Talk. Like, 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 okay, they're yeah, literally just massive so flies that suck your blood. I have a close Yes, they sting. The one with those stripes on them. I hate them. I hate them. You don't like caterpillars? Caterpillars are so cute, though. What about the green fluffy ones? They're fluffy as so they're literally so adorable. Okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, but like... But they're like right. So. Can they grow into this? Okay, that is not true. That's literally, that's not. That's, what do you think that came out of? That, is, okay, that does not exist in the game. Okay. They're like cute. Like, they, they move so slow, though. Like, look, do you think Disney can find you? Stop. They turn into butterflies. Look at them. No, that turns into a butterfly. Look at them, they're so cute. And they don't even eat like other animals. They eat like wood. They, they don't harm anyone. They literally. You know, some of them are poisonous. Like this. Okay, well, you're not supposed to eat it because they're bright. Like, don't eat a caterpillar. If I'm gonna be in debt, I wouldn't plan to be. You don't plan on eating a caterpillar, do you? No, I just don't. Okay, what is this turn into? Oh my god, that's so cute. Come on, they're so adorable. And they literally can't hurt you. They're literally harmless. Okay, they can't hurt you. Why would you? Okay, this seems like a But like, they're cute. Butter. Come on, they're so gorgeous. Okay, look at these. Yeah. Okay. No, no. The first one I saw what all do is like practice. Oh my god. Like, 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 oh, oh, like, and then I transferred out of it. Maybe that's where you're in. And I would just next to it. This is a very colorful. There's literally a purple. Wow, it's not blue. Yeah. 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 And so, is there anything that you can have?
when I'm just trying to add things in. Okay, that's terrible. Like, how is that helpful? Like, like, give them the highlight of the Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start here in a few minutes, so if you would like to find your seats, that'd be awesome. You feel free to keep talking, though. I do not mind. I'm not going to If you know your stuff, and you know you have more evidence, even the general research that the committee is going to be leads towards those things. So I think that you should go all right, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's finally dark enough where we can see the slides and it's not going to impact us too heavily. Uh, welcome to Science Under the Stars. Uh, we're predominantly a graduate student run organization trying to provide opportunities for grad students to give talks and then opportunities for the public to come out and kind of see what we're doing and kind of see some, some nice sciencey talks in an outdoor setting in a laboratory that a lot of us use, which is pretty cool. So tonight, uh, we're going to be hearing from Whitney Bear. She grew up in Chicago, then went to Northeastern Illinois University, where she majored in environmental science. Uh, she then spent a couple years with or, excuse me, a variety of different Chicago-based nonprofits, where she helped uh, recruit volunteers. She taught courses about grasslands and helped a lot of the prairie restoration in the area as well. Uh, she then made her way down to UT into Norma Fowler's lab, which is predominantly a plant lab, if you could not tell. And uh, a lot of her interests are around prescribed wildfires and how that affects essentially Texas grasslands. And so she wants to see or investigate further how these common land practices that we use can help either promote or conserve biodiversity in grassland areas as well as other like drought driven biomes. Correct? Awesome. I won't take up any more of y'all's time. Please give Whitney your attention. Thank you for coming out tonight. This is our third one of these back in person, and we're very excited to be doing this in person again, because um, it's just wonderful to see all your smiling faces out here when we do these talks. Is that going to work? It worked for me. Yes. Wait a minute. Yes, it did work. Great. OK, wonderful. So I'm Whitney Bear, and I'm in the plant biology PhD program at UT, and I study plant communities. When a bunch of uh, organisms live in the same place at the same time, we call that a community. And um, I study the plant communities here in central Texas, and the um, grasslands here have lost a lot of species over the last 200 years. And so I study the various management practices that we use to um, try and get some of those species back. Um, so this is a photo taken from one of my field sites in um, central Texas. And um, it's my job, in order to do my research, to walk into a field like this and know what all of those are. <laughs> so that might be a little overwhelming. Um, but the, the knowledge that I'm going to share with you tonight, the knowledge that I have about this, is not magic. Um, I'm not you know, some kind of special talent or anything like that. It's just it takes a lot of work and a lot of poring over books and talking to people and being wrong and being corrected and being gracious about that, which is really painful sometimes. Um, so it's, it's just like learning the names of everybody at a new job or in a new classroom. You know, you walk in there on the first day and you're like, I will never learn these names, right? And then one month later, you know everybody's names and you don't even think about it. So it gets that way when you practice, um, you spend a lot of time working on this stuff, you just then you start to get to the point where you look at a plant and you know its name. But that's because you've met it before, you know, just like a person, just like a friend. So the identity of individuals in a community can be very informative. 
And that's why it's important for me to know the names of all these individuals in a community. And it's important for me to know what species there are, but also it's important for me to know how many of each species there are, and then stuff about each of those species. What do they do in this community? How many seeds do they make? How big do they get? How much water do they use? Stuff like that. It's kind of like if you were going to build a school, you might first want to know how many children are in a the town, so you know how many chairs to buy and how many teachers to hire. It's the same thing with plant communities. So, you know, if we went into a, um, a grassland and we're trying to uh, get some of these species back um, or change, you know, so we change something and we, we look at all the, all the plants that are there before, my little stick figure guys, and you see they're all different colors and different sizes and in different kind of spatial arrangements. And then afterwards you go back and you're like, okay, well, it looks like the orange guys moved out and the, a lot of green ones and purple guys moved in and now we got a red guy. And you know, so if, if this is uh, if these types of changes were what we were going for, and when we made the you know if we did a prescribed flyer or something like that to our grassland community, we'd be like, great, our management worked. If this is not what we're going for, um, if these are the wrong species or they're not doing the right jobs in the community that we need, then we would know that we need to try something else next time. So tonight, I'm just going to give you a couple of tools to help you just get started on your plant journey um, or to help you along if you're already on your plant journey um, because you might not have time to spend years of your life reading plant books. Um, so we'll, we'll just try and get you jump started today. And then if you choose to spend years of your life reading plant books after this, then that's great. <laughs> First, I'm gonna tell you a story. So this picture here, I hope it's dark enough and you can see. Um, this picture here is a real text I got from my friend Daniel a few weeks ago. Um, and it says, what is this plant? You know all plants, right? And it's really far away, and it's really blurry, and you can't really tell much of anything from it. It looks to me the way it might look to you, just a big old pile of green stuff, nondescript in every way. Uh, I get texts like this all the time. <laughs> And it's actually awesome. I love it. I get them from you know my close friends. I get them from friends I haven't seen in a long time. People I haven't seen in 10 years will text me. I've even gotten plant ID request photos texted to me by unknown numbers. So people are like sharing my phone number around and being like, this is the person you text. So <laughs> I, but I usually get pictures like this. And this isn't very helpful. And we'll get into why. So what I said to Daniel was, you need to give me a close up of the leaves and the flowers. And if you can give me the location and date of the photo, that would be even more helpful. And he did. He came through and he sent me this one a day later. And you can probably even tell the difference from where you're sitting. This picture is it's closer up. You can see the shape of the leaves. You can see that the fl there's flowers on it. You couldn't tell in the other one that there's flowers in it. The flowers are blue. They've got a white center. Um, you probably can't tell at this re um, resolution, but I could also see that the, the flowers are a little fuzzy on the edges, and all of that was really helpful. And he also told me it was growing in Tacoma, Washington um, in March. So that gave me its bloom range, it gave me its where it lives, so I wasn't going to waste my time looking in my Texas books for this plant that grows in Washington. And I eventually landed on this guy as our suspect. It's a non-native plant, uh, it's native to Europe. Uh, and it shows up in lawns in the Pacific Northwest. So that was already, we're on the right track. And then, let's see if this guy works. Oh yeah, you can see you got the blue flowers, the white centers, the fuzzy leaves that are kind of triangle shaped. So that was how I, after much uh, creative searching, how I landed on this plant in a, uh, that I've never seen just from a picture that my friend sent me. So you're probably sitting there thinking, well, Whitney, what if I don't have an old plant friend that I can text my blurry, out of focus pictures to. Well, I've got great news for you. You actually have tons of botanist friends you didn't know about, and we're just on the internet. <laughs> so that brings me to the topic of uh, plant identification apps like iNaturalist. There's many apps like this. I, I just, I like iNaturalist, so that's gonna be our example tonight. Um, you may have heard that these apps will identify stuff for you. And also, by the way, I was instructed to tell you that these apps aren't just for plants, but I, I don't think about 
things other than plants. So I don't know about that side of these apps. <laughs> um, so they don't really, it's not that the computer identifies it for you. A lot of times how these work is there's humans like me on the other side, just scrolling uh, on this app and just identifying pictures for you. People who know by sight, you know, because we've met these plants before. Um, and also the other cool thing about the, these types of apps is scientists will sometimes use the data that regular people put on here, the observations, for research on the effects of climate change or rare and endangered species, lots of stuff like that. So you could be participating in research just by popping pictures up on these websites, which is pretty cool. Um, so I've got a couple, what I'm going to try and do tonight is give you advice for how to use these apps effectively and not be posting blurry, far away pictures with no useful details on them so that those of us who like to identify your plants for you on the internet can get you the best ID possible. So these are my, my three C's of putting pictures up on these sites. Make sure your pictures are close up, clear, and contain flowers and leaves. And I'm going to say about 35 more times probably that you can't forget about the leaves. So just settle in and prepare for that because most people forget about the leaves. Um, and then add multiple pictures. Sometimes people try to get all the detail they can in one picture and then you end up missing something useful. So don't be shy. Here's one of my, this is one of my real um, uh, observations and I've got flowers and leaves on here. And this little green flag in the corner says research grade. And that tells you that other plant nerds on the internet agreed with me that this is Texas thistle. And that's because I was able to give the leaves. If it was just the flower, they may not have been able to find that out. And then the other piece of advice is to take a guess, which might be a little nerve wracking sometimes if you feel like you don't know what you're doing. But if you, if you categorize it even a little bit, um, That'll help because I would go on there and I just filter by plants. And so if you put unknown, I'm not going to see it. You know, a lot of people probably do that or they have certain families or things like that. They like to help identify. So make sure you just try and take a stab in the dark. There's no crime. It's no crime if you're wrong. Just try. Um, so, but sometimes it's not so clear if it's a plant or not. Um, you might remember this concept from maybe previous Science Under the Stars talks or biology classes or something like that. Um, but all life is organized according to these levels. And the biggest one is kingdom. And I'm using the most broad possible definition of plant here tonight. And that's just, is it in the plant kingdom? Um, and a lot of times members of the plant kingdom um, are making their own food via photosynthesis and they've got special cells with cell walls. And that's really, those are the kind of characteristics that determine if something's in the plant family. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to play a game and I would like it if you really got loud with me. So don't be shy. Okay. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I just want you to say yes or no. Um, and again, no penalty for being wrong. Being wrong is part of it and it's kind of fun sometimes. Are you ready to play? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay. Here's our first guy. This one, plant or no? Yes. This is a plant. It's a cactus called Eagle Claw. And it is native to West Texas and extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, great job on that one. Good job. Okay, next one. No. I'm referring to. Okay, great. I didn't have to tell you what I was referring to. There are plants in this picture, but what I've circled, yes, if you're correct, is not a plant. It's a mushroom, which is in the fungus kingdom. All right, what about this one? This brown blob hanging from a tree. It's an example of a bad picture, by the way. No, no. We think no. I'm hearing some maybes. Yes. <laughs> okay, it is not a plant. So if you said that, you were correct. When it is a bat, it's a really bad picture of a bat. <laughs> so don't. Also, if you're taking pictures of bats, maybe get them in better focus than this one. Yeah. All right. Here's another good one. Okay, yes, a lot of debate on this one. I heard no's, I heard yeses. Well, it is a plant. Yes, it doesn't look like one, does it? It is not green, which is probably what you were looking for when I said, is it a plant? This one is not green because it's a parasite. 
it doesn't make its own food from the sunlight. It actually attaches itself to itself to the roots of a tree in the ground, um, and it gets its its food that way. Um, and yeah, and these are um, they're just really bizarre. When you run across them, this is another kind of bad picture. Actually, I took this in like 2013, but I really I got on my hands and knees and I was like, what is that? So yeah, if that threw you for a loop, that's understandable. Okay, what about this guy? Yes, that's a plant. This guy is ball moss. You probably saw if you were on the tour, you probably saw it out here at BFL. Um, this is uh, just one of our most delightful little native plants here in Austin. Um, not a moss at all, but actually in the same family as pineapples, if you can believe that. Nature is weird and wonderful. Um, whereas the last plant I showed you was a parasite, this one is widely believed to be a parasite, but is not. So all it, it's what it's what's called an air plant. Um, really, it's just if it's in your like oak tree in your yard, it's just hanging out there enjoying the view. It's not hurting anybody. So if somebody comes to your house and they say you need to pay me some money to spray your tree to get rid of this plant because it's a parasite and it's killing your tree, they are misinformed, and you should not be giving them your money. Okay, little home home improvement advice from your friend Whitney here today. Okay, what about this one? Yeah. Oh, you guys are so smart. I thought this was gonna stump you. Yes, this is, these are called living stones. And they're a succulent that um, lives in dry places. So it's got these really uh, leaves that are filled with water. And when the flowers grow, they just come out right between those little leaves. It's just so cute. <laughs> All right, what do we think about this one? This crusty stuff on these branches. No. No. This one's a trick question. I'm sorry I did this to you. <laughs> These are lichens, and they're a symbiotic relationship between um, between plants and fungi. And um, biologists are still fighting over where they go in the tree um, because they're kind of both and they're kind of neither. So they're really fun. And we have a lot of really fun looking ones around here in Austin. So when you're out, just definitely enjoy the incredible diversity of lichens we have here. Okay, what about this guy? No, no it looks like a leaf to me. You, you think it's not a plant? Oh, well, you're right. It's not a plant. It's, it's a bug. It's a bug. Yes, it is. Does anyone know the name of this bug? bug, bug. <laughs> I, Katie did? Did someone say it? All right. Well, it's a Katie did. Yeah. It's very cute. It's unbelievable, the, the detail, that they can look that much like a leaf. But yeah, this is an animal pretending to be a plant. Okay, what about this guy? Yes. Yes. Can't put one past you. This is a plant, but it looks like a bee, doesn't it? Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah, this one looks like a bee to attract other bees to come over and hang out with this bee friend. It's really nice. All right, great job on that. All right, so obviously you guys are already proving to me that you're very smart and um, but I just want to take one more second to convince you that you probably already know the names of more plants than maybe you think you do. So we're going to do the same thing again, um, except I'm going to put a picture up and you'll tell me what plant you think it is. You'll just shout out the name if you know it. Okay? Ready? Yeah. Come on. Yes. 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 All right, that's what I'm talking yes. about. Okay, yes, thank you. All right, what plant did this come from? That's a maple tree. <laughs> yeah. So many maples in Canada, they put it on their flag. I think that's so nice. Okay. What about this one? Dandelion. Dandelion. Correct. This one? Bamboo. Bamboo. Some of you might have a lot of this in your yard. If you have any, you have a lot. What about this one? Palm tree. Palm tree. Yeah. And there's coconuts on it too. I would have also accepted coconuts. What about this one? Holly. Yeah, holly. Yeah, it's like you might see this around winter time for festive winter decorations. What about this guy? The cactus. The cactus. I would have also accepted prickly pear. Sunflower. Sunflower. Wonderful. See, you know the name of so many plants. You might be thinking, what do I need Whitney for? Well, there's a lot more than meets the eye, so we're going to get into it. All right, so let's talk about the sunflower for a minute. This is very convenient because sunflowers are part of a family conveniently named the sunflower family. So that's easy to remember, right? You don't have to worry about, oh, what family the sunflower's in? Sunflower family, you got it already. So what's cool about uh, the sunflower family 
is that it's also a really good guess, even if you don't know what you're looking at, because it is the most, uh, it's the largest plant family on the planet. Um, that's actually tied with orchids if you want to get specific, but it's one of the largest, one of two. It's got 32,000 species on the planet, just that we know about. So if you're like, is this in the sunflower family? There's like a pretty good chance it is because there's so dang many of them. All right, so another cool thing about this family is what you think of as one sunflower flower is actually multiple flowers. So I'm gonna do this. So you've got two different kinds of flowers. What you would think of as the petal, it's called a ray flower. And what you would think of as the center of the flower, those are all, it's many of them, they're called disc flowers, okay? And here's a diagram to kind of help you with that. You got disc flowers in the center here, and then the ray flowers are the ones that have the, what looks like the petals attached to them. So that's one thing you can look for if you're like, it looks like a sunflower, and then it's in the sunflower family. If you can see these parts, you might be like more convinced that it's in the sunflower family. Um, but because nature is weird and wonderful, sometimes some species in this family are missing parts. And this species, this purple guy here, is missing the um, ray flowers. It only has disc flowers. So these flowers here, these, all these little purple flowers on this spike here are in the same shape as each one of these individual yellow. It's probably hard to see from where you're sitting. Um, but those are all disc flowers no ray flowers. So a lot of people look at this and they're like, there's no way that's in the sunflower family. And uh, nature didn't read the book. So we have stuff like this. You have a question? Is that Blackfoot Daisy? It is Blackfoot it's Daisy. Like the sunflower yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. Daisies are in the sunflower family. Yeah. All right. So we're going to play this again. And I'm going to put up a picture of a flower, and you tell me if you think it's in the sunflower family or not. So you say yes if it's in the sunflower family, and no if it's not in the sunflower family. Are we ready? Yes! yes. yes. Great. Great. Wonderful. Okay, this guy. Yes. yes! Yes! And is it because you can see the ray flowers and the disc flowers, or did you already know that? <laughs> This is a very famous uh, wildflower in this area called Indian Blanket. It's blooming right now, so you might see it from the roadsides, or it might be in your yard, or when you're walking your dog, you might see this plant. Um, I have some in my yard, and it is just going off right now. Um, very, very nice member of the sunflower family. Okay, what about this one? No. no, it is not in the sunflower family. That's in the next family we'll talk about, but I won't give you any spoilers. What about this one? Yes. Wow. This was this was my trick question, and you got it. All right. Yes. This is in the sunflower family. Um, the big, this whole big head here is made up of a bunch of tiny little sunflowers. You you can see it on this picture. I tried to point out the disc flowers and the ray flowers on this one, but it's very small. So if you can't tell the difference between them from where you're sitting, that's understandable. All right. What about this? This looks familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. It is in the sunflower family. How do you guys know that? This one trips everybody up. Yes, but it only has disc flowers. So it's a big old weirdo in the family. All families have some. Other question? How do you pronounce that? Liatris punctata. Yes, we've got, so yeah, I put the names up. Here's the common name, Blazing Star, and this is the scientific name after it. So depending on what level of interest you have in these names, I put them both up there for you. Oh, what about this one? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and this is, uh, as someone already pointed out, this is Blackfoot, ba Blackfoot Daisy, another one of our native plants. Um, this one loves just like basically no soil and no water. It does great. I can't understand it. I'm an overwaterer, so I can't have it in my yard. <laughs> okay, so if you're going to take pictures of members of this family for iNaturalist or one of these apps or even to send to your friend Whitney, um, You've got to take pictures of the leaves. Remember I said I was going to say that a bunch? Settle in. There's a lot more times I'm going to say it. Um, so this is, a, uh, this is two pictures from the same plant, Engelmann's daisy. And you can see the, the leaves in this are pretty interesting looking. They've got these deep lobes in there. The stem is kind of fuzzy. And all of that is really useful information to help identify it. And like these flowers just you know might look to you like regular old 
yellow sunflowers and may not give you the information you need. So always take pictures of the leaves if you possibly can. Now this is somewhat more specialized knowledge, hopefully for some of you. Um, for this family and for quite a few families, but specifically this one, you wanna take a picture of the underside of the flower um, because there's a lot of information under there that gets lost. The top of the flowers might look the same, but underneath it's a world of difference. So these two are closely related. They're both in the same genus. If you're not familiar with this, it's kind of like how you and your, if you and your cousin have the same last name, kind of like that. Um, and, uh, and underneath, you can see this one has these like red, flat, kind of pointy little scales on the bottom. And this one has these like alligator teeth looking green ones on the bottom. And without this information, because their leaves actually happen to look similar as well, I would not be able to tell them apart for you. So you need to get me this information and I can help you um, tell your sunflower family plant apart. Okay, so to recap, if you're trying to get a picture identified, should you just post this one? No. What's it missing? Leaves. Leaves. Yeah. And? Yeah. And the bottoms. Yes, absolutely. There it is. Oh yeah, I <laughs> forgot I had the little circle on there. Yes, the leaves and the undersides, wonderful. And of course, you it's not that you should not, I guess this is misleading, it's not that you should not have the top of the flower that is useful, but have these other things in addition. Okay, so that was the sunflower family. I'm about to move on to the next family, starting with another plant I'm sure you know. Blue bonnets. Those are our famous, our state flower, the famous Texas blue bonnets, yes. Everyone knows these. Wonderful. They are in the pea family. And if you look at the at, at the uh, seed pods here, don't those look like fuzzy sugar snap peas? They're in the same family as the sugar snap peas. And so this is a really great character you want to look for to identify this family. If they've got these seed pods on them, definitely get a picture of them. What uh, this family is the third largest plant family, and it's got. 20,000 species in it. So it's another good guess. If it's not in the sunflower family and you're like, oh geez, I don't know what else it could be. And it's probably in the pea family. That's a reasonable guess mathematically because there's so many of them. And another cool thing about this family is they can be trees. So that's pretty neat. You probably saw this one around a few weeks ago. It was blooming all over town. These beautiful pink trees are called red bud. Um, and because they were blooming a few weeks ago, if you go look at those same trees now, you might notice these guys dangling off of them. Also look like sugar snap peas, don't they? So that's something if you're trying to get this uh, tree identified, you want to take a picture of the seed pods, flowers, you know, really get the, um, really get those sugar snap peas on the on film, as it were. All right, another uh, important character for this family, it's not, not all of them, but most of them, or it's really, really common for them to have this thing called a compound leaf, which you might remember if you took a plant class back in the day or been to other plant talks. Um, but the, uh, all these little guys look like leaves, but actually this whole thing is the leaf and it's coming off the stem right here. And this is opposed to what's called a simple leaf where if the whole leaf is attached to right here, it's not cutting, <clears throat> it's not cutting to these little, these little leaflets, okay? So one of these little guys is called a leaflet. The whole thing is a leaf, and you'll see this a lot in members of this family, so keep an eye out for this. I'll show you what I mean. Here's two native species from this area, Illinois bundle flower and golden prairie clover, and they both have compound leaves. I've circled in white the whole, one whole leaf for each of these plants. <clears throat> you can see the Illinois bundle flower kind of looks, that leaf kind of looks like a feather. It's so deeply compound. And the other one has bigger leaflets, so it might fool you into thinking, is a bunch of little simple leaves, but it's not. <clears throat> Another good reason to take a picture of the leaves, I'll give you many examples, is uh, these two species. Also, you'll notice they're in the same genus. They're both Senna's. Um, they're both native here. They both bloom at the same time. And it's not just you. These flowers look the same, okay? If you just sent me a picture of these flowers, one of these flowers, and said which one of these two Senna species is it, I would not be able to tell you. I would need a picture of these leaves. So this one has like, the leaflets are in pairs. There's two, it's hard to see, but there's two of them here. They're kind of skinny. They're a little pointed at the end. This one has a much lo longer 
uh, leaf. Remember, this is a whole leaf. And the leaflets are round. They have this little point at the end. And you can't feel it because it's a picture. But those leaves are so soft. So if you ever see one of these, touch the leaves. You'll, you will not be sorry. OK, so to review the pea family, is this a good picture? No. Tell me what's wrong with it. No leaves. No leaves. Wonderful. What else is it missing? It's blurry. The seed pods. And also, is this picture close up enough? No. Can you tell what these are? <laughs> no, yeah. So that's not a good picture. You want to get, if, it, if the seed pods are there, you want to get the seed pods. Always get the leaves and try to get a close up, clear picture of those flowers. So now you're experts on taking pictures of the pea family. So I'm going to tell you about one more family tonight. And then we're going to start with another plant you definitely know already. What's my arrow pointing to here? Grass. Grass, right? Everybody knows grass. Come on, Whitney, that's grass, obviously. Well, what you may not know is there are a lot of different kinds of grass. This is the um, fifth largest plant family in the world, and it has over 12,000 described species. So, um, yeah, you might have to take more pictures and more detailed pictures when trying to get a grass identified than you might have thought. So here's a very intimidating photo. Please don't panic. I'm not going to make you do this. But these are this is a uh, from one of my ID books, and it's all the stuff you can look at to identify grasses. The good news is you don't have to do all this. Um, for your pictures, you really just need to focus on two structures on grasses. And the first is what's called the inflorescence. And that's just a big fancy word for a whole bunch of flowers all together. Okay, so each one of these little, each one of these little dots is like a little flower, and they're all collected together. Okay, and now you might be a little confused at this point and be thinking, wait a minute, I've seen grass. I know grass. Grass doesn't have flowers. Well, most of the grass that you've probably seen or that we normally see is mowed and kept very short, so it doesn't get a chance to produce flowers. But it can. And if given the chance, it will. Um, so let me show you some pictures of some beautiful grass inflorescences from some species that are native here. Um, these are um, these are all the inflorescences, and you see we've got a couple of spike. It said spike and panicle were the two kinds, and we've got both represented here. We've got this one that's like looks like a firework. You know, that's a more spread out version, whereas these are um, all up and down, kind of in a line. And they're really, now that you see them all right next to each other, you can probably see that they're pretty different. And this will, <clears throat> this will give you some confidence that if you can get a picture of this type of thing on a grass you're trying to identify, that we might be able to get you pretty close to identifying it, if not all the way there. So now the other thing that you want to look for is a little hard to describe, um, but it's called a ligule. And it, you can find it by gently bending back the leaf, and it's right between the leaf and the stem. And I, I don't know why, but there's a lot of information in what that ligule looks like. It might be present, it might be absent, it might be shredded, it might be in a V shape. So um, to someone who knows what they're looking at, if you can get a picture of this structure, then you're, you're home free. I mean, there's a lot of information we can work with with that ligule. So I'll show you what that looks like. As you might imagine from looking at these pictures, it takes a lot of patience to, and maybe some time in the blistering heat of a summer's day to get a picture like this, but it's really, really worth it. Um, but you can see, it's just, I folded back the leaf and that's the stem behind my finger there. And this right here, this little kind of V-shaped brown thing, that's the ligule. Um, and that's on a species, uh, the native species called Indian grass. And the way I remember that one um, is the, the guy who was doing the grass ID walk that I went on, because this is how I spend my weekends, people, um, is he said, uh, it was here in Austin, and he said that it looks like a little hook em horns, doesn't it? So hopefully that'll help you remember how to identify Indian grass. <laughs> All right, so this is, this is one of my photos, so we can make fun of it. Is this a good picture to identify a grass from? What's wrong with it? 
wonderful job. Yes, and this is a very common type of grass ID picture you'll see when you start looking on iNaturalist. You get a lot of this. It's a big clump from really far away, and people are like, what grass is this? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so a quick word of warning. You may have noticed that I have my hand behind the plant in a lot of these pictures. Um, and I can do that because I know the plants pretty well, and I know which ones might harm me and which ones might not. So I can feel confident touching the plants. Um, but while you're learning, I highly recommend you do not do that. Use a, um, you know, a notebook or a piece of paper, whatever you've got, something other than your hand, because you just never know, you know, until you've learned some of the plants. So who could tell me what this one is? As poison ivy, leaves of three, let it be. And there's another. Um, We've all heard that leaves of three thing, but what I like to tell people is to look out for like a hand shape on the leaflets. So if you haven't had that tip before, I always tell people to look for the thumb on the leaf. All right, so this is embarrassing, but we're all friends here, so I'm gonna share it with you. This is a real iNaturalist observation I made when I moved here. This is a poison ivy, but it's without its leaves on it. And I did not know that this is what poison ivy looks like without its leaves on it. So I took a series of pictures with my hands behind it. Um, and then everyone on the iNaturalist, the reason I put this one up is these berries apparently are the telltale sign. So look sharp. Um, and don't repeat my mistakes because I was so embarrassed. Everyone on iNaturalist was like, hey, are you itchy? <laughs> um, I ended up not uh, getting poison ivy rash from this experience and I'm not really sure why. We're all you know, on some level allergic to the oil that's on these plants and I did cut it open at one point. so. I don't know what happened, just lucky I guess, but do as I say, not as I do, and until you know the plants, don't do this. <laughs> okay, so we want you to try this at home, obviously. There's kind of three layers to this. The first one is just taking pictures of cool plants you see, using all the tips I've given you here today, and posting them on iNaturalist or something similar and having um, experts like me out there helping you identify them. Make sure you get your great pictures. Make sure they are clear, close up, contain flowers, and what? Leaves. leaves. Don't forget the leaves. I'll say it a thousand more times. Um, and that'll, that'll really help you get those great IDs. And um, if you want to get even more into it, you can get a bunch of field guides. These are three books that I really like for this region. They're really useful for different kinds of plants. We've got grasses, we've got woody plants, and we've got wildflowers. All these books work really well, and I use them regularly. Um, I'll try and get out of the way so people can take pictures of this. Um, I'll put this back up later if you want to see them in a minute. But yeah, so these are good. But I do want to say that a lot of field guides are arranged differently for different skill and interest levels. So there are some field guides that are arranged by flower color and not by flower family. And you might like that if that's where you're at and that's how much you know time you have to spare to do this those are really great books it's super easy it's yellow let me go to the yellow section some of them are arranged by plant family and get a little it require a little more knowledge you have to know you're looking at a plant in the sunflower family and then go to that section so maybe check out a few from the library and try them out before you commit to buying some because um, it's easy to have a field guide problem <laughs> so again learn learn from my mistakes now if you want to get really 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 into it like where i'm at these are the books you need this one here in the middle is three inches thick um, in print it lists every plant in north central texas where it lives and you know, how it's different than its closely related plants and all that stuff and it's got a lot of really intimidating um, in, uh, vocabulary in it. So when I'm using it, I keep this guy next to it. This one's a really nice one, kind of whoever you are. And it's just tells you what all those plant terms are. You know, you're like, apress trichomes, what is that? I'm gonna throw this book out the window. And then you pull out this guy, you take a deep breath, it tells you, and you keep on moving. Um, and what's really cool about this big, uh, uh, book in the middle here is it's available for free online. I made a QR code for you because I learned how to do that and <laughs> need to do it now. Um, this is through the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. They offer this this whole book for free online as a PDF and that's really nice so you can just you know control F to the 
plant you're thinking of and see if it's the right one. And I'll leave that uh, QR code up there in the next slide. So if you really loved this talk and you want to go two more times, here's some opportunities for you to do that. I'm doing this talk again in San Antonio and then after that at a, a public library here in Austin um, for your viewing pleasure. So I've had a blast telling you about all my favorite plants tonight and uh, I hope you had a great time and I will take any questions you have. So the question is, um, uh, she's working in a herbarium and she learned that um, a certain number of plants in North America have not been discovered yet and she's wondering how you know such a thing. Um, I don't know how you would estimate something you don't know about. Um, I'm guessing it's uh, something about like, we know that this there's like uh, this many in, um, in this family, you know, typically. And like, so with the ratios with the other families and the other plants we typically see in this area, maybe, but that is a great question. How do you know you don't know something? It's a large philosophical question that I don't feel prepared to answer, but that's a really good thought. Yes, sir. Um, my son and I, uh, a couple times, we've seen uh, near our house what looks, looks for all intents and purposes to us as a blackberry, but, and it's got, you know, kind of a purple vine and thorns and everything, but um, I'll, I've been told by a bunch of people that's like, it's a dewberry or something like that. Do you have any idea whether, the, what that might be if it's native? Yeah, I think what you're describing is the is a, a native um, uh, plant in the raspberry genus called uh, the common name is dewberry. So yeah, I think that's what you're describing. And this is another thing too. I do get this all the time where it's like people will describe a plant to me and be like, "What is it?" And it's weird that I can do it. <laughs> Feels good. Yes. Do you keep some of the for invasive ones? What about the invasive ones? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are quite a lot of, uh, the question was uh, general advice about invasive species, which is a, a big question in a whole field of study. Um, but yeah, there are plants that are, you know, not native, um, and so they don't have natural predators or anything like that, and so then they, their populations kind of explode, and it creates this imbalance, and um, they can crowd out native species and contribute to biodiversity loss, um, which is happening at an alarming rate right now. Um, General advice, um, like in your yard or something like that, is, is you know if you can know about these species and like learn how to identify them and catch them when there's just one plant, instead of like your whole yard is is these invasive species, and that goes for um, you know uh, rangeland management and national park management and stuff like that too. If you can catch it when it's small, um, before the population explodes, then that's the best time to catch it. Um, the second best time is today. <laughs> yeah, in the back. A little louder, please. Good question. Yeah, so um, she's saying in the book sometimes they'll say that the plant is naturalized but not native. Um, and that's probably something you can look up in that. Um, that terminology book I told you about, but I'll tell you, I won't make you look it up. Um, it's, it means that it's, it's not, you know, it's not native, but what the word naturalist, nat naturalized means is that it's been living here for a really, really long time and, and it's not really causing any problems in the ecosystem. So it's, it, it's not problematic in the way an invasive species would be, but it's also not native. So it's possible for a species to not be native, but also not be a problem. And that's what that means. Yeah, I got one in the middle here. Okay. 
the question is what happens to bluebonnets after they flower, is that correct? Yes, okay. Um, well, what happens, they're annual plants, which means they, each time, e each one of those that you see flowering is only going to do that once, and it's going to make a ton of seeds. You saw in my picture how many seed pods it made. So it's going to make a whole ton of seeds, and all of those, and then it's going to die, and then the, all of those seeds are going to grow next year. So the plants you see next year are the ones that the, the blue bonnets this year have um, uh, produced and then dropped on the ground. Yes, sir. What's the best way to study a plant? That is another big philosophical question. What's the best way to study a plant is the question. Um, that is a matter of opinion. Um, my opinion is to, you know, leave it in the grassland where it grows and go out there in the heat of day with a really good hat and a lot of sunscreen and a lot of water and just study whatever you want, you know, measure it, count its flowers, whatever. That's, that's because that's what I do. That's my favorite way to study a plant. But there's many, many ways and there's a lot of, you know, genetic techniques and um, someone in the back mentioned herbaria and that's where you, you'll, um, with permission uh, or with a permit, you'll collect the plant, you'll press it, just like arts and crafts, um, and then you'll, you'll give it to um, basically a library for plant specimens. And so at the, at the, at the UT uh, herbarium, we've got a million or so dried old plants. And so people can go in there and be like, wow, this plant isn't, this species isn't here anymore, but it was here 100 years ago. And so then you can, you can get kind of long-term data sets that way. So that's another way you can study plants. But, you know, my favorite way is the best way as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, the question was, is, is DNA a really big part of my research, especially when we were talking about, like, is it a plant or is it a fungus, you know, that kind of stuff. I personally don't do DNA work, but that is basically how we know um, something like when we're talking about lichens or something like that because it looks for all the world like a plant and then you're like oh actually <laughs> there's some fungus cells in here you know or there's some you know other kind of DNA in here so that's like there's a lot of work in that area um, it's just it happens to be not what I do but you're right <laughs> maybe I should <laughs> yes sir um, what like what is that stone plant you showed in is that a plant like what is it related to and what the heck is it <laughs> the the question is the living stones plant i showed um uh, what the heck is it is the question um it's i don't know what i don't remember what family it's in or what it's closely related to but it's like if you if you have um it's a succulent plant so it's got a lot of those kind of desert adaptations so that's why it's so weird you know because big showy leaves like you think of you know, in like a maple tree or something, is really expensive. You're gonna lose a lot of water through that leaf. Um, and so the plants that live in deserts uh, needed to create these, uh, these leaves that can store water and that are really small and close to the ground. So that's what the heck it is, I guess. Just a plant doing its best in the desert. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Isaac is so happy. He knew someone was gonna ask me this question. <laughs> I, I get this question all the time and I have yet to come up with an answer for it because I really love them all. <laughs> so I can't pick a favorite. I'm so sorry. I know that's very disappointing. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> yeah. What's the best time to see wildflowers? Right now. Sorry, the question is what's the best time to see wildflowers? Maybe not right now because it's nighttime, but um, this time of year, is the best time in Central Texas to see our very famous spring wildflowers. But I will say, I will add, even though um, we don't really think about it because we only think about the spring flowers, there's often a really nice floral display in our natural areas in the fall, like in August and September. That's when that, that big, tall um, yellow thing with lots of tiny little flowers in the sunflower family I showed you, goldenrod, that's when it's blooming. The purple weird guy in the sunflower family, it's blooming at the same time purple and the yellow look incredible together so 
right now is good for spring, and then August is good for fall. Another one? Sorry, if I seed, when do you seed them? Oh, I thought you said seed. See. Both I'm is sorry. fine. I'm sorry. All right, I misheard the question. It would seed wildflowers. And um, in this region, the best time would be in the early winter, late fall, like October, November, December, especially for blue bonnets, if we're talking about blue bonnets, because because they're annuals, they need the winter, we have these mild winters, right? So they, they need all that time to get their little leaves going and their little roots going so that, you know, when it hits March, they can, or April or whenever, whenever it happens to happen based on the weather, um, they're ready to give us that big floral display. If you plant them in the, um, if you plant them in February, they'll, it'll probably get too hot out before they can get big enough to produce a flower. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, sweetheart, you got another question? What is it? The question is, does grass grow in spring and does it die in winter? Is that your question? Okay. Um, because there are so many different kinds of grasses, it depends on which species you're looking at. Um, what you're describing is an annual plant, like blue bonnets, that um, grows in the spring and then dies off in the winter, but there are plants called perennials that stay alive underground though. So you may not, it may look above ground like they're dead because they're all brown and dry, but underneath the roots are still alive. And so then they'll grow from those same roots next spring. So the grasses do both things. Anybody else? Thank you very much, Whitney. And uh, because I'm not a coward, my favorite plant is a pitcher plant, which is kind not of not a coward. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. That was, that was an awesome talk. Uh, we have one more before the semester ends. So on May 12th, we'll be back out here. And we have Carly Scott coming in from uh, another DNA lab, but they use corals. So we're going to be investigating ancient corals when we come back in May. So thank you all for coming out. Drive safe. Have a good night.